Thank you for the introduction. Uh, the topic, obviously, is accurate sound reproductions in a, in a living room, in a home. Uh, it has always been since the loudspeaker design was always, uh, well, not always, but for much of my uh, life, a hobby. My career was someplace else. Um, I basically designed and built loudspeakers for myself, for my own personal amusement, and even still today, that's what I'm doing. And on my website, I basically share what I have learned uh, uh, with enough detail so that other people can build it themselves, try out, see whether what I'm saying is actually true, and they can confirm it or not. But that's really my background. And in a way, that's been, I think, a big advantage because I did not have to design uh, loudspeakers to make a living. So I was not bound by marketing considerations and uh, could basically explore what, what uh, uh, seemed to be the directions one should go with loudspeakers there. So since I'm also married and I have a wife and uh, she has certain inputs on, on what goes into my living room, and I think that's true with, with, for other people as well there, um, there have been pretty strong influences to keep the, the size uh, as small as possible. So I've always tried to, to uh, do just that and see uh, how small do they, can they be. And as it turns out, in, in hindsight, I will tell you that uh, I think one should design acoustic point sources or very acoustically small sources and not, not uh, that going big and large boxes is not necessarily the step in the right direction here. So with that much of an introduction here, uh, this here is an example of the living room in our house. You see uh, four speakers in there, D and M dipoles and monopoles, and I will talk about it in detail more. Uh, but I just wanted to point out, this, this is here, now this is California, so it probably looks very different from, from the U.S. as far as, the, uh, from England here, as far as the living room is concerned. But uh, to the audiophile, I now coming through the door into this room, there are a few things standing out right away. First of all, there are windows, big windows, left and right. There's a fireplace there. There is a lack of uh, uh, absorbers acoustic treatment and, and various things that you read about and find in uh, many rooms that are dedicated to uh, audio and to listening. My philosophy has always been that sound should be part of, of my normal living enjoyment and it shouldn't require a special room, special setup there. And so uh, part of the development of loudspeakers that I pursued was to find an answer or a solution that would work in a room like this, for example. And I have, I have had different places that I lived in, but the, the goal was basically the same. Now, uh, here is a very important uh, point that I want to make right away. Uh, when you play a recording over two loudspeakers, all you can hope to get is an illusion, something happening between your ears because this is not stereo, is not the same like uh, playback over headphones, in a, like in a binaural recording where you have a dummy head with, with, ear, with microphones at the eardrums and you play back those signals and over headphones. So you get an exact reproduction of the uh, acoustic situation that was in real life. It is also not uh, wave field reconstruction where you may have a whole lineup of loudspeakers all around you, and you're physically trying to reconstruct the actual wave field in terms of pressure and direction of particle velocities at the place where you're listening to. Stereo is two loudspeakers, and it right away has a problem because each loudspeaker I hear with both ears. Something that is, is typically not happening in real life situation. If you hear a person speaking, both ears get the signals, but there isn't a crosstalk in the sense like I get if I wanted to reproduce that person speaking over two loudspeakers in the form of a phantom image. So it's inherently something unnatural and uh, uh, 
we, but the processor between the ears is reconstructing or giving us a phantom image and giving us the illusion of something happening that physically is not really happening. Okay. Now, in order for this illusion to be uh, really solid and not be given away, we have to minimize any confusing cues. I always compare it to a, a magician's act. There's a stage magician who has this, this young lady in a box and he is cutting that lady into two pieces. At least that's the way it looks. But this, the magician is basically very careful not to give you any cues that would make you think he is not cutting her in two. Now, you know in your mind and say, well, it's not going to happen, there's not going to be any blood, you know that. But the illusion is so good that you have a really hard time saying, now, how is it possible? What is he really doing? Okay. And stereo, in a way, is, is something very similar to that. Okay. So it's very important to uh, avoid cues that tell you we are not there, we are not listening to this orchestra here. There are certain cues that we know are misleading. Everyone knows that uh, the on-axis frequency response, say the free field response, should not have too many variations, wiggles, peaks, dips in there. We know that. Uh, we also know there shouldn't be resonances in, the, in loudspeakers. Uh, resonances mean there is energy stored, which is in time released more gradually. Uh, nevertheless, uh, resonances are pretty much in most loudspeakers these days. When you have a vented system, you have a built-in resonance. Uh, another uh, cause for, for misleading cues is nonlinear distortion, which is the generation of new sounds that were not in the original recording. And another source that gives the loudspeaker away is diffraction, secondary radiation of the edges of the, of the box or the cabinet there. They, they tell you that you are listening to a loudspeaker and not to the real thing. There are also confusing cues that are contributed by the room because we usually listen to loudspeakers in rooms. We may measure them under free field conditions or in an anechoic room there, but then they end up being listened to in a living room there. <clears throat> and the major uh, cues that the room contributes are the modes and resonances at low frequencies. Again, well known. It can get very boomy in a room. I think more so in, in Europe than in America because of the home constructions. Here is, you use rooms with brick and concrete. In the US, it's often just sheetrock and plywood. So the characteristics are different, excuse me, but uh, uh, these, are, these are giving you cues that you're listening in a room that the room is contributing. There is also the loudspeaker as it's set up in the room causes reflections, sound is bouncing off the sideboard, ceiling, floor. And those uh, can give you misleading cues. You all know if you put a pair of speakers or too far over to one corner, the stereo image will not be nice and symmetrical. It gets pulled over to one side. It also depends how far away you are, like how much the reflection is delayed. Uh, it also depends on the spectral content of the reflections. Like if you have absorbers at the wall, it would change the sound. Not necessarily make it better, but it will change it. And, uh, of course, it depends on the characteristics of the room itself. How fast is sound decaying in the room? All these can give you misleading true cues. And the game is really, in sound reproduction, to minimize those cues. Then there are some cues that are not, not everybody would agree on.